My main interest over the last, I don't know, 15 or 20 years has been um, perception, sense perception. So I'm interested in how uh, human beings get to know the external world by, um, by, by the use of their senses. But in the last few years, maybe the last three or four, uh, I've become interested in internal perceptions. So uh, one important uh, class of internal uh, sensations or sensing is um, the bodily urges. So hunger, thirst, fatigue, sleepiness, um, sexual desire. These are all sensory states, I think, but they're interestingly different from the sensory states that I was I and many other philosophers were interested in before because they're not about the external world, they're about the body itself. And they play a very different role and I've been investigating this quite uh, intensely over the last few years. I haven't written very much because I've just been immersed in the literature on the topic which is quite uh, difficult to come to grips with philosophically for a philosopher. So the, the research project I, um, I'm working on at the JHI relates to what I was talking about before, namely internal sensing. Uh, but it relates to another uh, puzzle that I've had for a few years now, namely uh, the problem of, of the, what I call the problem of um, global aesthetics, or some of my colleagues call it the problem of the geography of taste. Which I think was the title I used for the JHI. The problem is this. Everybody in every culture has various forms of art, music, dancing, literature, theater, uh, decoration, and so on. Um, and every artist in every culture says that they are aiming for beauty. Uh, however, if you compare cultures, you find that what one people in one culture find beautiful, people in another culture don't. Um, so color is an ex excellent example of this. Some cultures like bright, highly contrastive colors, and that's the way they decorate. Others like very muted, subdued colors, and that's the way they decorate. Um, and neither likes the one um, that the other chooses. Uh, another more complex example is music. Uh, everybody in every culture says that their music is beautiful, but if you look at Chinese opera, Hindustani classical music, and hip hop, there are very different things that people appreciate in those, in those cultures. How can, so there seems to be a little bit of a paradox there. Um, now the standard way of, of uh, accounting for that kind of difference, or any difference at all, is to say that uh, beauty is subjective. Um, so that whatever it is that one appreciates, or whatever gives one enjoyment, or whatever gives one pleasure, that's subjective. Um, and what people in each culture are striving for is a subjective value. Now, uh, I think that's right, as far as it goes, uh, but it leaves out something very important. What it leaves out is that in each culture, art has standards. So take hip hop, or take any other form of music that you care to name. Uh, anybody who's into it is going to say, that's a good artist, this is not. Now, the person who evaluates hip hop in that way is not able to evaluate Hindustani classical music or Hindustani or Bombay film music for that matter, um, using the skills that they've acquired in appreciating hip hop. Um, and the reverse is also true. So it's, it's 
all very well to say that there's a subjective element in it and there must be some subjective element in it but um, how do you account for standards people the fact that people can discuss the merits of an artist in that culture or in that genre uh, without um, just appealing to personal taste people don't say oh I just like that person better they say something their technique or the, the the way that they bring their emotion to bear in, and so on and so forth you know you know how those discussions go so those two things are um, seem to pull in opposite direction the fact that across cultures you can't evaluate beauty uh, that but within cultures you can there's also the question that beauty is not always what people aim for they aim for difficult sometimes even ugly presentations of fact, but let's put that aside for a second. So that was the project that I brought to the JHI. How can we talk about pleasure in a way that accounts for both of these things, both the subjectivity, not the subjectivity, but the variability across culture, um, and also the um, existence of standards within, within culture. And uh, that's what I'm working on. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to really learn more about um, the cultural variability that I talked about. There are people here from very many different uh, approaches and very many different uh, disciplines and many, very many different uh, areas of study. Uh, and I'm hoping by, uh, by coming to know them and discussing with them that I will come to know a little bit more about, uh, I'll be able to give substance or give bones to my project of um, global aesthetics. Yeah, so something quite unexpected really, or two things really that are quite unexpected um, one was um, a book about how birds navigate. I think it was called uh, The World on, on the Wing, something like that. Um, and it has extraordinary insights into how um, birds navigate over long distances, even tiny little birds like finches and, uh, and also, of course, huge birds like geese that we're very familiar with. How they navigate, uh, you know, to to uh, uh, between the seasons, and um, it's just a fascinating book about sense perception, which I had never, uh, and it's a phenomenon that I had never really come to grips with before. Uh, and another one is um, um, a forestry professor from the University of British Columbia called Suzanne so Suzanne Simar. Uh, who writes about communication between trees in a forest. Um, and she's become quite famous, but I discovered her book before she's, before I think she became a thing of popular culture. So the other day I was watching an episode of Ted Lasso in which somebody brings up Suzanne Simon um, and her insights into tree communication, but I found her a little bit before that. So, I don't know if it's a fun fact about me, but it's something that I have fun doing, and that is cooking. And I've uh, become interested in the question, uh, can food be art? Now, of course, food can be art in the sense that it can be visual art, so you can make a cake that uh, is like a sculpture or something like that. But I want to know whether food can be art just because of its taste uh, or because of its flavor. Most philosophers, and I think a lot of uh, people in the, in the arts, think of food as not an art at all. And yet it has many of the characteristics that I was talking about earlier. There are standards, there are uh, cultural differences, and so on and so forth. And so that's kind of a fun thing that I've been looking at. 